coming up on this episode of the Marco Martins Revolution. So that's why it is so difficult because you have to balance the two rights, your right to dignity and my right to freedom of speech. I'm allowed to say whatever I want to say. You have a right to dignity. In producing results better, faster, yeah. more efficiently mm-hmm. and cheaper is only a good thing yeah. for especially startup entrepreneurs. Number one, you need to look if what you've come up with is available. And number two, you need to protect what you've come up with so that nobody comes on later and copies your idea. The Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. As you know, I've stopped doing intros because you stopped listening after 30 seconds. Thank you very much for that. But my guest today is Jessica Delata. Uh, she is an attorney at law with her own practice specializing in commercial law legalities jessica welcome to the podcast thank you so much for joining me thanks so i wanted to speak to you about uh when you contacted me you said you were so interested in podcasting and and you have so much to share uh i normally don't take those on like when people are like oh i want to come on your podcast i'm "Mm, (laughs) no sorry no um but with the entrepreneurial side of things becoming more and more part of because it's something i'm passionate about it's becoming more and more prominent part of the podcast because i feel like there's so much entrepreneurial information to share and people going more and more into self-employment into side hustles freelancing things like that and of course you are a professional services practitioner in that space of entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. so i want to start there let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey before we go into the legalese of how to help people on their entrepreneurship uh, journey specifically yeah so i mean my legal entrepreneurial journey is not my first one um when i was in varsity you know side hustles i had a tutoring business where i used to tutor little kids and yeah i tried to make that work in cape town that didn't work so i'll try to hire people but left that there studied law um and yeah with law because you have to do your articles i had to go straight into working for a boss um and yeah i mean you start off on a really low salary and because it's so long you the the sort of qualifying process you get stuck in working for a boss because you want your salary to lift and um yeah so I worked for I worked in corporate for about four years and after the COVID pandemic (laughs) um I decided that I needed to go out on my own I'm still young I've got the energy the time and yeah I started my own firm and I haven't looked back like you said, it's not wasn't your first venture into entrepreneurship. And it's it's sort of an odd one because I mean, even the first one that you brought up, you were tutoring and you tried to hire people. Extremely difficult. Anyone who's hired people, employed people, <laughs> find it extremely difficult to have to rely on other human beings. And it's one of the hardest parts of entrepreneurship. Um, but large scale entrepreneurship away from the professional services industry. And this is why I find professional services so unique in the entrepreneurial space is that it's still so heavily reliant on you and your work. Mm. It's a a service based business, which is so different to a lot of the entrepreneurs we speak to because people in the entrepreneurial space, they venture into entrepreneurship for the sake of entrepreneurship sake. Whereas you're a qualified professional, you're working as an attorney, uh, just for yourself, you know? So we've we've gone through a lot of basics of business on the podcast before like my advice always to people is that uh, a lot of people who especially in the professional services space when they start their own business some of the things that they want to do is you you're trying to be like really intelligent and smart with your money so it's yeah. like i'll do my own bookkeeping yeah, yeah, yeah and then until you get to the point where you figure out like oh i spend this many hours on bookkeeping i could pay someone this much yeah, yeah. and it's less than 10 percent of what i charge per hour yeah I mean, so I do that. exactly so it's the, the professional yeah. side so that element of entrepreneurship where you calculate the value of your time mm. versus what it'll cost you to have someone else do that for you yeah, and bookkeeping is always my prime example because yeah. it's the one we all tend to do we do our own bookkeeping to try and save a little bit of money yeah. and it's literally the worst one to do yeah literally no. the worst one to do it's more efficient cheaper to hand all the bookkeeping over to someone else yeah um but 
that's that's the difficult part of the, what I'm getting at at the end of all of this is the difficult part of entrepreneurship in a professional services space is so heavily reliant on your time, yeah. on your expertise, on your practice. So it's almost like you're working for your customers. Yeah, definitely. You've just stopped working for a boss. Now you work for your clients. Yeah, but I enjoy my clients way more than I would enjoy a boss. Of course. <laughs> because I've specialized, um, I think that the clients that I've got i don't know if you can say i've chosen they've chosen me we've chosen each other and um, we have good relationships and i prefer dealing with them um and i would take it over working for a boss any day because i mean yeah they take my advice they ask me they come to me with their problems and i can solve them really quickly so yeah sometimes it turns into a huge massive instruction that goes on for weeks and sometimes it's really quick mm. and yeah so i find that the, like the, the changing of clients the changing of work is much more fulfilling than working in a job so I feel now that that's all out the way, I feel like we can get into the discussion that we really want to have here. And I want to focus on startups mm. and some of the things that startups um, don't focus on. And let's be honest, there's so much to focus on is, yeah. with a startup, right? Entrepreneurs, we get excited about the product. And then the, the excitement of the potential of the product makes us mm. focus so heavily on operations of the business. And then there's several other elements in in the operation of a business away from product operations mm. right so that um you've got sales and marketing which is one of the biggest ones mm. and then the product and those those are the two big two and then you have to look at things like bookkeeping which yeah. is like a grudge <laughs> yeah. you know you want to look at bookkeeping and tax because those are the things that catch up to you eventually and the the non-sexy the non-exciting parts of a business um, so startups, one of the things that we don't look at, one of those non-sexy things is the legalese around it. Mm. And one of the things we ignore is trademarks. Mm. So you come up with this idea, you come up with this business. If you're not especially unique, a lot of the time we're like, there's no need to trademark this. Other people are doing what I'm looking to do. I'm mm. just looking to do it in a different way. Mm. Why look at trademarks? Yeah, I mean, I think the pro the first problem would be if you're not unique, then you need to go back and rethink it. <laughs> because with any product, any brand, any business, you definitely want to be unique in the market. I mean, think about Apple. They came up with Apple for computers. And that's all you think of when you think of a computer and you see an Apple. So number one, you should definitely try to be unique. But once you've done that, um, yeah, I mean, registering your business name, uh, doesn't protect you from other people copying you. Um, yeah, I think people forget that when they they register their business, that that doesn't prevent you know um, somebody else from copying your exact idea. And if you go into and <laughs> over and above that, you've come up with this idea and you think it's super unique, you think it's amazing. Um, how do you know that you're not technically copying somebody else? Maybe you know, in your subconscious, you've seen something on TV and you, you don't remember. And that's actually where you got the idea from. And then you get sued down the line because you haven't checked it out. So there's two prongs to it. There's number one, you need to look if what you've come up with is available. And number two, you need to protect what you've come up with so that nobody comes on later and copies your idea. So this is trademark law. This yeah. is, this is one of the starting points of startups. Mm. And, um, so you have this unique idea, this unique business opportunity, but you need to trademark your logo and your name. Yeah, so you can trademark your logo, your name, um, you can trademark them together. Pretty much anything that um, is a sort of a mark or a sign that shows customers what your goods are or services are in the, the marketplace. So yeah, it's sort of like a badge of origin. It can even be your colors, um, you know, the yellow in the m of mcdonald's that if, if it was a specific you know uh, color palette you can trademark that and make sure that you know nobody copies copies that specific um color that's associated with your brand but that's in a specific space right so it's very hard to have like trademark law protect you when someone's using a similar name or something similar to you but in a completely different industry well, you know, the, it's it's tricky because a lot of the the um, requirements are that yes, it must be in a um, similar industry, goods or services. However, if you are a well known mark like McDonald's again, mm -hmm. or KFC, or BMW, you I can't now take the BMW um, logo and apply it on clothing or apply it mm -hmm. on a clock. Um, that's that's copying. So if you are well known, then it's in any 
you know, sort of mm. industry. But yeah, I mean, that's sort of a, a kind of a loophole. Um, if yeah, it's somebody comes up with carpets and their name is, I don't know, Genie, then you see Genie carpets and you go and you make car oil or whatever. That's, you know, you can't stop somebody who's made car oil with yeah. your name unless yeah i mean they've they've identically copied your, well, your text and genie, stuff well right how far back does that go yeah. it's like am i gonna sue the writer of arabian nights for the word ge genie yeah but you that know, would be a really know. bad trademark don't do that but yeah. <laughs> but well it depends i mean genie for carpets is bad but genie for car oil is really good like genie car oil yeah is because that our next startup? yeah <laughs> because i mean again an apple it's not like somebody went and sued Apple because they used their fruit name, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, who yeah. came up with the Apple? Yeah. Try find them. Adam. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Look, Adam, if you are out there somewhere, speak <laughs> to Jess. There might be a good suit on you. On for yeah. you. Or Eve, tell Adam. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that's a really good starting point. Like you say, I, I like that element. It's not something I thought of. Is that the immediate thought with trademarking is the idea of protecting your idea, mm. but also protecting yourself from over investing into something that's like someone else is already doing. Yeah. Right. And, and doing it in the wrong way. Exactly. So like, let me go and spend a whole bunch of money on marketing. Yeah. So and then, yeah, like a lot of the time people outsource their graphic design. So you are a company and you come up with lots of brands and say your car company and you come out with, you know, new parts uh, and brands underneath your main brand all the time. Um, you have a in-house graphic designer, they design your, how it looks, the, the stylized word mark and they're doing it on Canva and you don't really know where they're getting it from. Um, and you have, then you go and you, you know, you trade with it and actually they copied somebody else. So the first step would be to do a search, um, especially if you have in-house designers, um, if you're doing it yourself on Canva, <laughs> if you, you know, like you just want to make sure that it doesn't already exist on the register and not only on the register of trademarks, it doesn't exist on, you know, just in general um, out there because even if you don't register, you still have rights. Um, yeah, so that would definitely be the first step. So startups, I think your main priority is to avoid looking too much like someone else in your industry. Definitely. And we're talking about things like you come up with an idea of a ticketing business. Mm. You you want to sell tickets to concerts and stuff mm. online using some sort of very special, cool, new digital way of doing it. Mm. You don't want to come up with a logo that looks like Hala. Exactly. So someone who's really well known in that industry. Exactly. Because then you're immediately going to be in trouble. Exactly. So you want to avoid that at yeah. every cost. When you're coming up with your new and even something confusingly similar like fowler or or even if because i think howler's um logo is like a wolf howling if you then had a lion you know same concept um it's equally as infringing as something that's exactly the same and that's a lot of the time what people do they they see something Purposely. yeah they see something and they're like oh that's such a good idea let's just tweak it a bit but it's cool because i changed the first letter and it's like no if it's if it's confusingly similar then it is it's a problem yeah. Yeah, especially when you can see some sort of intent, right? If a court's going to look at that and they're going to yeah. be like, clearly your intention was to utilize and leverage the yeah, like brand off. name yeah. Yeah. of a company that's already successful and you're trying to mimic that and, yeah, and leverage, off piggyback. Ex, yeah, yeah, off their success. Exactly. Mm. So I and think that's, that's what's an protected, interesting. actually. You're also giving away how much partying you do by knowing Hala's logo. Well, I work a bit with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they're a client. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, look, very cool brand. And, and I think that's the mark of a good brand, right? So talking about the entrepreneurial space, the, the idea that Hala comes up first when they're a fairly new player in the space mm. compared to people like Quicket or mm. uh, CompuTicket, who's mm. like probably what the, the first yeah. digital ticketing yeah, yeah, yeah. offering in South Africa. Mm. For Hala to be the first name that comes up with like a digital ticketing service, mm. you have to commend them because they're a fairly new player in the space, mm. but they have... Um, they have disrupted the industry yeah. enough to become like one of the f forward players, one of the front yeah. runners in the space. I think also because they, you know, they 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 came up with a good business model with the paying system mm. and and um, going in the event space that is, you know, younger, more yeah, beyond, up and coming. Yeah, looking at it, and I think there's God, it's a great, great uh, model for people to look at. Is okay, cool. There's a lot of people doing the front end side of ticketing it's like mm. cool you've got your tickets now we're done we're out once mm. you're at that event don't talk to me again mm. talk to me when you need refunds and then i need to speak to yeah. my clients about yeah. how you're going to get your refund and stuff like yeah. that but that's it mm. whereas hello we're like well let's get deeper mm. how do we how do we monetize further and deeper into yeah. that same event space yeah 
you know, let's let's give people a safe way to transact mm. financially at the event so that people aren't carrying around cash or you're not yeah. having multiple pay stations where people are swiping their card multiple times, things like that. So really great business model and they've disrupted mm. the industry for good reason. Mm. Um, speaking of industry disruption, uh, the idea of AI now yeah. coming into play and I, I love having an attorney in here because I think they – we're immediately the most frightened of Mm-mm. all the people. Mm-mm. No, not yet. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, Mm-mm. I'm not frightened. I'm fine. I'll pay for my subscription. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. I'm not going to be replaced by the AI. No ways. I use the AI. They, they passed, like ChatGPT just passed the bar exam in the United States yeah. in the top 10th percentile yeah. of, of all people. Um, Better than me. I need AI. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I think that's, that's one of the good messages. So in the previous episode of this uh mark sham i think we spoke about it like two or three four episodes ago uh we spoke about the idea of ai being disruptive and i think the most fear the thing that has driven the amount of fear in ai progress today is the idea of technology now disrupting white collar workers yeah like now taking jobs from the white collar industry whereas historically new technological inventions have disrupted more the blue collar space. Mm. And for the first time, AI is looking more terrifying for white collar industry yeah. than it is for blue collar. And I think that's what's scary about it. But historically, human beings have always overcome whatever technological and disruptive development there yeah, has been, including it. the internet. Mm. And we utilize it mm. and use it to our strength. So as much as we do, I do try to warn people that there is change coming and it's not going to be easy. Change is always difficult. So there's, it's hard times that can mm. come up. Uh, if you utilize it and leverage it because it is coming instead of trying to ignore it, um, you you will have the upper hand on others who use it in future. Yeah, I mean, I think also with the AI, um, it's only as good as your prompts are into, you know, the, the AI man woman yeah. whoever she is <laughs> um and i mean i'm yeah personally i'm definitely not worried about ai at this stage maybe taking over the world but not necessarily taking my job because i mean a client comes to me for example commercial agreement they literally have no idea what needs to go into the agreement yes you can tap into ai what needs to go into a commercial agreement but it's not specific it's like it doesn't have emotion it doesn't have you know it doesn't know you can put it in your facts but it doesn't it's not gonna have the same experience that i've got it hasn't been to court it hasn't had to live Mitigate certain terms like I have had to, which I would input in sp- specifically in relation to that client. So, I mean, I use it like an assistant. I'll put in my prompts or whatever to make it quicker, but then you know, sometimes I have like three or four chats open at once and then I combine them. So yeah, I mean, potentially one day it will learn, but th- at the end of the day, the reason the client's coming to me is because they don't know. So I mean, I know that's how I can use it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I like the idea of this. And I think the disruption in the legal industry has been a long time coming. Mm. We, first of all, we're talking about startups here. Mm. These aren't people with huge amounts of capital mm. that they're prepared to throw at something in the same way that large corporations are. Mm. Large corporations have already been trying to pull down, pull down, pull down their legal costs mm. over the years. Uh, and the idea of billable hours mm. bringing you to a certain solution mm. is something that's been getting disrupted for a couple of years already. Mm. So the idea of AI assisting attorneys like you mm. in producing results better, faster, yeah. more efficiently mm. and cheaper is only a good thing yeah. for especially startup entrepreneurs. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, it takes our hours down a whole lot and, you know, we get, I mean, it's not always accurate, but we get more information Uh, much quicker and I mean at the end of the day the reason why um, things took so long is because not everything was available on the internet not everything was available on your computer because I mean when I first started working in a law firm I literally was typing out so many things that were not even available on Google you know now it's it's much quicker and Mm. it's just making everything faster and yeah, I mean, you're going to get the results, but also when it makes things faster, people get into trouble faster. So I don't yeah. think attorneys are ever going to be out of business because people just keep getting themselves into trouble. Well, I hope not to. That's <laughs> one of the things I've always said is that that's the last person you want to need to speak to is your attorney. Yeah. Or first, actually, to keep to save you from getting into trouble. Yeah, well, I hope not to need it. Yeah. But if I need Run it, it then you'll definitely the be the first person to speak to. Oh, that's for sure. Thanks. Okay, so the business landscape, of course... Massive economic issues facing South Africa, 
energy crisis, mm. things like that. What energy crisis? What energy crisis? <laughs> Please, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. The lights are what on. What do you it's mean? Fine. Yeah. Everything's Bye. fine. Yeah. Um, but the idea of South Africans uh, stepping into entrepreneurship, side hustles, startups, things like that, it's, it's something that's progressively increased from uh, the late 2000s into the 2010s and then even more prominent now is people either doing self-employment, freelancing work and entrepreneurship and the number of people employed by major corporations diminishing over time. And I think this interestingly connects a bit to labor law, right? The idea of big companies protecting themselves from labor law disputes, having a very, very large labor force mm. and a major, major labor bill, mm. rather paying freelancers to complete the same work rather mm. than going in-house and internal with things. Mm. I think there's like a balancing point that needs to be struck. But I really like the idea of people being able to work from themselves, especially with technology aiding mm. you, where you can have, like you, I'm sure you've experienced this yourself, is that you don't have to be part of the major law firm to compete on the same footing because exactly. you've got tools like ChatGPT, because mm. you've got these different technological tools that allow you to communicate when you're traveling to Australia. You've recently had a trip yeah. to Australia and you're still able to do your work from over there. Mm. I think that's a very interesting balance. And it's really exciting for me that people like you now mm. have the opportunity to compete on an equal footing. So a lot of my clients are, um, you know, companies and they don't have in-house legal and they just outsource me for whatever they need every now and then. And it's nice for me because obviously I don't have to go into the office. I don't have to um, listen to a boss or whatever. And they trust my expertise and I have a few clients like that. So it also enables me to get more work and to make more money because, I mean, you're earning a salary at one company and I can and, – and also if I'm busy, I can, I can outsource somebody to help me. I can get a junior um, and they can just help me with whatever um, mundane tasks I need and then I can just juggle all of – these corporates <laughs> junior chat gpt yeah. <laughs> junior assistant yeah. no i think that's the remarkable thing and it's such a hopeful message for especially young people who are very interested in entrepreneurship i think we live in that age of entrepreneurship mm. you have baby boomers and gen x who come from a world of go study get a get a degree like mm. an attorney mm. and that's not a guarantee enough no. anymore you know like yeah. go be a doctor go be an attorney go be an accountant and that's yeah. the way to success and now you find a lot of people who just have a good idea maybe have a bit of a knack for entrepreneurship mm. they have a lot of uh room in the marketplace Definitely. and they have a lot of more access to the marketplace than people had before and obviously it's majorly connected to technology mm. so away from the business space and i think i think we've covered quite a lot of things and it's really exciting and stuff but just the idea of talking about uh, baby boomers, Gen X, and now obviously millennials or Gen Y uh, millennials. Have, where, do we, where do we go after that? Well, Gen Zs were the next one, and now we've got a I, new I, I. one, Gen <laughs> Alpha. Oh wow! Yeah, what I found is, and and I've had a lot of interaction. My ex girlfriend was was an attorney as well, like you. Also went into private practice, etc. What I find remarkable about you is some of the most intelligent, capable people in the world. Stop. Attorneys. <laughs> really? They are. They're, you're well educated. Yeah. You're very capable. You do a difficult job that not everyone can do. It takes a certain amount of in intellect to do it. And then you watch the most garbage television shows when you get home. Selling Sunset. <laughs> Selling Sunset. Yeah. yeah. Because we all Jewish believe, matchmaking. We all Indian believe matchmaking. that actress from like the 90s that we remember from a million and one different shows, she now sells houses <laughs> automatically. Wait, oh, Chriselle. I don't know. Yeah, Chriselle. I don't, I don't know. I know there's pretty girls She's selling now houses to in Beverly Hills. Oh, wow. Well. Is she really? Well, I think in some, in the st some of states of America, she's not. But yeah, who knows? I've just always found it remarkable. Yeah, no, Is it, I love it. Do you find that as a way for you to switch off? Do you feel yeah, this so desperate I, need to switch off after working all day? I think, I think it started with, because I read a lot all day, that I didn't feel a desperate need to read after hours. I mean, I've just started, I bought myself a Kindle because I'm like, I need to start educating myself. But I would, yeah, I would stop work and then I would watch reality TV and I just find it fascinating how these people live their lives. Yes, it's not real, but it's just so much drama and I love it. <laughs> I think, yeah, again, I think it's just a way of switching off. It's like, I want something that I don't need to follow. Yeah, I and I can be on my phone and I think it's a girl thing as well. I mean, I don't know if there's probably some girls that don't like reality TV, but I think like, like, yeah, like 75% of them love 
the fact that they can be on Instagram and watch the show and speak to their friend and do all of the same things. All yeah, these without things having to pause and real. What, yeah. what happened there? Exactly. Let me go back and see what happened yeah. there. And then you hear so. them fighting and you quickly put it down and then you carry on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's the elements is, okay, first of all, women love two things more than anything else is reality TV and crime documentaries. Like anything with a serial <laughs> the killer. The murderer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. True crime podcasts yeah. and yeah. and What's reality Jeff TV. Bundy. No, Ted, Ted Bundy, Bundy and Jeff. Was the name Jeff something? The guy who cut up his people. Oh, um, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not not the most fascinating character, but it seems to be everyone's favorite serial killer because he ate have people. Have you watched it though? Yes, I have. He was very good. Evan Peters, good actor. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant Jeff. Jeffrey Te- Dahmer. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer was okay. very good. Let me make this very clear. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying Jeffrey Dahmer was a good. He was person. really good. No, he was a good serial killer. <laughs> Please don't cancel Jess. <laughs> she means that he was efficient at killing people, not that it was good in Look, any he wasn't way. that good because he got caught. But, I mean, you know, he was good while he wasn't caught. He didn't get caught for long. Well, he wasn't very good at all. It's the police who were very bad because he was killing minority oh, homosexuals in a – Yeah, well. especially in the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, minority group homosexuals, the police yeah, didn't really care kidding. what happened to them. So that's why Jeffrey Dahmer got away with it for as long as he yeah, did. I suppose. Um, but that's but why he was But then someone like Ted that. Bundy, who killed young pretty girls, yeah. blonde girls on university campuses, there was a bigger drive to catch him. Mm. The problem was that people expected serial killers in that time to be social outcasts, whereas yeah. he was particularly good looking yeah. and charming. Narcissist, yeah. like some people we may not. <laughs> Are you they accusing be, me of being not, a narcissist? What, if the shoe fits, I wasn't actually. <laughs> I was just saying narcissists that we know might be serial killers, actually, also. Not you. <laughs> I didn't yeah. say you're a narcissist. You did. I was going to hire you as an attorney, but I, it's a conflict of interest because you're the person I need to sue for defamation. But it's only if I'm lying. You're clearly <laughs> lying. Clearly. It's not a narcissist. You're clearly say. lying. Um I, I haven't murdered any people. You're welcome to investigate me. Just don't audit me. Just a narcissist. Just don't audit me. You can investigate. I don't know how to audit. That's fine. Good. I'm glad. People who do I'll not hire to audit, my audit don't audit. No, don't. Don't come audit me. Everything's fine. Ask SARS. I'm sure they. it's fine. Don't worry. Uh, let's talk about defamation, actually. Now that we're talking about that, I'm saying that I'm accusing you of defamation. Of defaming you. Yeah. Now, this is one of the hardest things in the legal process to to prove, isn't it? It's To prove a loss of income mm. is, is the main way to actually get a successful suit through defamation. Yeah. And it's really easy if I am a guy who has a job, I work for a major company... Mm. You go onto Twitter, you say, I did something, I proved that I didn't do that, but I lost my job because of you going onto Twitter and saying something. Now, that's a very easy mm. case of defamation, is that you will now be liable of all of the financial loss that I've yes. suffered. But there's so many different levels of this in between uh, someone who hasn't been impacted at all and that. Mm. Let's talk through like how difficult it is to prove defamation. So I think the reason why it is so difficult is because, I mean, everybody's got constitutional rights, right? And you've got a constitutional right to freedom of speech. So that's why it is so difficult because you have to balance the two rights, your right to dignity and my right to freedom of speech. I'm allowed to say whatever I want to say. You have a right to dignity. And if my right to freedom of speech infringes on your right to dignity, then you're only entitled to damages. So the court always has to balance up those two rights because not one is more important than the other. So the loss of income is the easiest way to prove that, that my speech right has infringed on your dignity right and it shows in the form of damages you've lost income or something like that. So that's technically why it's difficult to prove. It's very interesting. It's more interesting than family law because we all know how family law works. It's a <laughs> guy and a girl, they have a kid, they hate each other oh, no. now. So now you're not allowed to see the kid because I hate you. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, hold on, yeah, lady. The kid wants to see you. <laughs> yeah. He spoke to you really Why do you badly. say lady? You know, the men also do it. <laughs> Dear audience, I do not mean to stereotype everyone. Um. Purely speaking from a space of statistical averages and the vast majority of family dispute cases. So statistical averages also show that the reason why the lady's so angry is because the man's not paying. 
I agree. <laughs> this is one of the things you should pay. Yeah. Like you, you really should pay. Yeah. Also, why are women having children almost exclusively with deadbeats? This seems to be the yeah. thing. Why only yeah. deadbeats are having kids? Like, like I think it's because maybe they don't think pay for in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Capable men, I, 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 I blame phthalates. <laughs> so anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, oh, phthalates is a chemical that's in plastic products. Uh, it's directly correlated. Oh, I normally to, read it. It's like phthalates. Yeah, it's like P H T H. Like it's a it. oh fur fur. Yeah, but oh. it's it's pronounced phthalates. Yeah, and it's a chemical that's in plastic products that's been connected to fertility issues amongst men directly from Drink the it. 1970s. Drink it. Yeah, <laughs> so phthalates leaks into your consumable products like food, like beverages, things like that. And it's been connected to a decrease in fertility in men. Clearly, men who drink from plastic bottles are, are the ones who are employed. And yeah. the ones who have healthy sperm, they, they're able to have babies, but they're not drink able to tins. have a job. For some reason. <laughs> Another disclaimer. This is comedy. Don't it's a podcast. It's a comedy podcast. If you have a kid and you have a job, don't comment on YouTube saying... Or I pay my child. Well done. Yeah. You should. Yeah. You should pay your child support. <laughs> Literally, it's an easy thing. Yeah. Yeah, but she uses the money for it. Let her use money for <laughs> her hair. Yeah, like, why are you fighting this? But why are you so angry that she's using your <laughs> money for her hair? Yeah. Let her do it. Your yeah. kids have school uniforms and her hair looks good. Yeah. Move on. She has to drop them off at school looking great. Looking great. Yeah. So every judge hates me right now. Yeah. Good thing that I'm not, it's not exactly like my target audience, judges. No. I don't think I have a bunch of judges listening to my nonsense. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, it is fascinating, isn't it? Like the family law dynamic is fascinating, is that first of all, it's more and more prominent business in South Africa. Obviously, divorce statistics increase every year. It's yeah. like not something that's coming down mm. post COVID. I'm Definitely. Remarkable uptick in it. The amount of time that a family law dispute takes is excruciating. Yeah, the I mean, thing that people go through. If people would just put their egos in their pockets, it would go so much quicker. But people just argue over principle, and we basically fulfill the function of a psychologist, friend, hairdresser, because you know they tell the hairdressers everything, yeah. and it's really just personal. It's not even legal at the end of the day. And yeah, yeah so much of it, and. I mean, I don't mean to uh, expect you to have a deep understanding of international law, but from a South African standpoint, we actually have very good laws in place in terms of the child's best interest. Yeah, right? we have amazing. I mean, our legislation is amazing. It's some of the best in the world. The mm. problem is just the enforcement of it. Mm. Um, not only from, you know, like a sort of the police um, aspect, but um, our court process, it takes so long because mm. we are over, the courts are overburdened. So if like... I mean, me as an attorney, my job is literally just to tell you what is written down on the paper and to give you the advice on which pieces of paper you should look at and what would be in your best interest or the child's best interest. Um, if you just listen to what I was saying, it would work. Um, but people like to argue and then they get to court and then that's what the problem is, is that if you just follow the, the law, it's a really good option. <laughs> I love this idea of public logic versus... <laughs> Like, I, it's like, I'm going to sue you for this and that with no understanding yeah, of the law or how it yeah. works at all. But my logic says that I'm the victim here yeah. and therefore I'm entitled to this. Exactly. And then you're like, no, actually the law says this. Yeah. And it's like, well, the law's stupid. Well, yeah. well done. Go yeah. argue. And I'm angry. With the law. And I'm angry. Yeah. yeah. So, but yes, like South Africa, especially good at protecting the child's rights. Mm. I mean, our law is very focused from a family law perspective. Yeah, our law is very child, yeah. focused on the best interest of the child. Mm. Um, so I find that very interesting, but people use their children to hurt each other. And this, yeah. is, this is one of the concerning things. Yeah. Yeah. Because also parents think they know what the best thing is for their child because they are emotional and they're like, ah, oh, but the mom or the dad, um, shouted at me. So that's, what's going to happen with the child. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the kid needs a relationship with both parents, even if the, the parent is a bit, you know, short tempered, but short fused. I mean, obviously there's, there's certain limits to that, but mm. that does more damage to, you know, isolate your child from the parent than it does, um, for them to just see their grumpy dad or grumpy mm. mom, you know? Yeah, as long as, and the court will always look at it as like, that doesn't constitute child abuse. No, you definitely know, so it's not. Like the, yeah. the and I mean, there's reports, there's reports, you get reports, you get psychologist reports, you get family advocate reports. They, It's not up to you to say, 
that your child is being abused. Mm. Obviously, if they are very bad, so then. social workers, yeah. they go do an evaluation, things exactly, like that. Exactly, psychologists, mm. yeah. Very interesting. Not especially interesting, actually. I, mean, <laughs> I don't have kids. I, ju- I just yeah. find, yeah, no, no, no. The interesting part is actually really the drama. Yeah. Once again, it's like the reality TV yeah, elements yeah, yeah. of it. Is you like, know, it's good. It's interesting in the beginning, like when I get a new client and they tell me their drama and I'm like, oh, you know, wow. Shit out there is wild. <laughs> so yeah. glad I don't have that. But eventually after months and months of it, you're just like, oh, you're not tired. Like, do you not want to just go and find a new boyfriend yeah. or girlfriend and just move on and stop with your ex? <laughs> Which is actually part of the, one of the most interesting things is people always like, yeah, but, but she's got a boyfriend now. So surely <laughs> she's in the wrong yeah. and that I can like see my kid yeah. and I don't have to pay because she's got like, my child has met a new boyfriend. It's like no, yeah. the, the new boyfriend doesn't do anything to your child. No. He's not abusive. He's not in, the, the new boyfriend has no factor. And it's probably better. I always say to my clients, I mean, it's probably better. Do you want your partner to go out and, and meet somebody else? Because then they're not going to be relying on you only for money. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's, but the drama is the fascinating part of family law. Right? Yeah. I mean, she, it's yeah, one of the his new that. girlfriend. You must see her. I, I don't have to see her, actually. Yeah. The court's not going to look at her at all. <laughs> yeah. But tell me. <laughs> yeah. well, what's, what's her name? What's her name? <laughs> I'll just go I'll stalk. go search yeah. her quickly. <gasps> she's pretty. I mean, no, she's horrible. Not like yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely stepped down. Yeah. No, I, I, can't, I, I think it's... I don't say that to my clients, though. You're very professional. I have to I be. Isn't, don't I? I don't know. Are you being, you, was that sarcastic? No. Oh, okay. I, I, I really do believe you're professional if you're not telling your clients that the, the new girlfriend is very pretty. No, but I am telling my clients to go out there and date. Tell them to go on Tinder okay. or whatever they need to go on. Don't go on Tinder. Hinge. It's a cesspool. Hinge. I've actually never been on. I have no... Hinge. Hinge, I, is, Hinge is definitely... Is Hinge It's good. a better... Yeah, so there's another one, Raya. Have you heard of Raya? I, I don't know dating app stuff. So Raya's like the celebrity one. Like Ben Affleck is on that one. Well, he was on Why that. He's now he? married to J Lo, but but yeah. like the celeb, but it's all hard because they're in Los Angeles. But Hinge is much better than Tinder. Tinder's like no. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly think, a seasoned do you professional. Think I could, like, okay, so Ben <laughs> Affleck and J Lo are going to get the book. I'm going to want people put it to all know on fucking dating app. <laughs> I've never been on a dating app before ever in my life. I've never used. I Tinder. I made my ex husband on a fucking dating app. Maybe Which I one? should go off Tinder. Tinder. You know that the market share of dating apps, you know who's got the greatest market share of internet dating? Who? Instagram. Oh yeah. But I think the difference with Instagram is that like like people don't know you're single. Like you're not you're not necessarily on Instagram for that particular purpose. Like if you're on a dating yes, app, you don't know the girls your I actual know. but your actual purpose on a dating app is literally to Date. to meet yeah, to yeah. meet another person. Like I get that. Instagram can be a bit invasive if people are just messaging you and they can, can be. You. You're a woman. You know exactly. I don't actually how receive that many messages on Instagram. Honestly, what? yeah, like people. Just, well done. Yeah, it's gonna just, change now. You just think I'm a bitch. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, it's gonna change now. You know, all these guys who listen to well, my they podcast. mustn't listen to. They don't put this fucking dating thing. <laughs> it's in. Like uh, this is the one I'm not removing. I'll remove anything you want I'm about the law and I'm not on a dating app. I was just lying. All my friends tell me. <laughs> I'm apparently my photos are on one. Oh, so somebody stole you? Someone stole my photos. Celeb. I'm f- I'm flattered. Yay, you're famous. I'm, so flattered. I'm waiting for somebody to steal my Instagram. Yeah. But Guys, thing, please report. The thing is, like, oh yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah, it hasn't happened to me yet. So. If you see a profile with my name, like very similar, and it says private account, use this link for like Fansly or whatever, whatever. Don't report it. That's me. Yeah. That is me. That's only my fans. new accounts, my only backup fans. account. Gosh, I've actually got an OnlyFans story that I can. That I can Tell me your OnlyFans story. Not me. I wasn't on OnlyFans, but when, oh. I was in, when I was in Oz, my friend is um, friends with somebody who manages OnlyFans models. Oh yeah. And um, is what, it a is it a guy or a girl? A girl. Okay, so that's always automatically safer because yeah. it's always weird, like when a guy manages OnlyFans yeah. stuff. Right? Yeah, and yeah, and but she was. I was listening to the call of she was. So my friend was introducing a friend of hers. She wants to start an OnlyFans account. Mm. And she was obviously talking to this chick who manages them. And she was saying how if you post naked pictures on OnlyFans, you don't make money. So, yeah. So it's not what you think. Like, okay, yeah, maybe a topless photo here and there, but that's not where you make your money. You make your money off of oh. the messages. So, mm. but literally you can just post a, like, and they like selfies or whatever, but yeah. it's not naked. Yeah. Like if I wasn't a lawyer, I would fucking, you know how much money they make. They can make like, they can make like um, $10,000 a week. So, a week. So 
I think of messaging. So you, and you can also sorry to interrupt, but you can automate. You're very passionate. The mess. I just think it's so much money. Yeah, you can make good money from just replying. But a bank. people who manage it correctly. So it's like people think that they're gonna go start an OnlyFans, but it's like I don't want it to spill into my personal life, so I'm not gonna post my face. I'm not gonna post about my OnlyFans on Instagram. It's like how are people. I gonna think find if you it? have like a big following, if you like 50k plus, then yes. you can literally post once on your Instagram story. Yes. You need what like 10 people a month. We can't put any of this in, by the way. No, we're it's not going good. to. Okay. But you need like 10 people a month. And then you literally have, why can't you put this in? It's a business. It's not porn. It, it, it's porn. Let's not, <laughs> let's not give <laughs> into the propaganda. <laughs> OnlyFans is porn. It's so not They try to remove porn and that tells you, you how can't much it's porn because of the uproar across the whole planet when they there were There are like, people who do when, porn on it. Yes. But the ones I'm talking about are not. They pictures of their feet. Jokes, maybe like their legs as well. But like That's porn now. <gasps> feet is porn now. So he's modeling porn. 2023. If you model your feet, yes, it's porn. <laughs> what? <laughs> if you're standing there in, in a guest bikini, you're doing porn. Thing. I don't get the feet thing. Why do guys like feet so Dude, much if like somebody it? would pay me for my feet, I would give it to them. Anyway. Their feet. The feet pick, I mean. That's what yeah, I'll give them. Would you not? If somebody said to you, I'll give you 10 grand for a picture of your I'm feet. a guy. I'll send pictures of anything for 10 <laughs> grand. But no one's offering fuck all for a guy's Not only of. feet. Only feet. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just waiting for somebody to ask for there's my a feet great, pics. There's a great meme with the only, and we're not putting any of this in. <laughs> but there's a great meme that, um, that was showing. It's like, oh, bro, why are you on OnlyFans when you can get porn for free on like sites like Pornhub or whatever? Why are you paying for porn on OnlyFans? And then the guy's like, that's not what it's about. And then it's like. <laughs> you talk to them personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, he says, he says, that's not what it's about. And then the next slide is what it's really about. It's him taking a picture of his face, <laughs> like saying to her, what do you think? Yeah. That's, that's what it's about. Because they're talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just to get like validation yeah, for his penis literally. or, or to get, um, what's it called? Ridiculed. Yeah. So that's like the two things is like guys send pictures of their penis. So they either want her to say, oh, you have such yes. a great penis. Yeah. I want to do this and this to it. Money. Or she must say, you've got a disgusting little small penis. You're such a little, they love that oh, shit. Oh, do they like a, that? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, why yeah. would. Apparently oh. that makes up more oh. of the contribution of it. And psychology is fascinating. Wow. Human beings are amazing. Shall we finish off this podcast? I don't know why my exes don't like me then. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because uh, you make fun of their penises. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Their psychology is off. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're doing it They're wrong. the problem. They're the problem. <laughs> Look how many guys I could <laughs> yeah, have. Literally. I could have so many guys. <laughs> <laughs> and money. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. let's wrap up the podcast because I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> yeah. This is so great. Maybe I will keep some of it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been a great little journey into all sorts of things. But uh, I'd love to have you on again sometime. Thank you so much for joining me. Cool, thanks. This episode of the podcast has been brought to you by Vodcast TV, Johannesburg's premier shared podcast studio platform. If you've ever wanted to host a podcast for yourself or your business, there's simply never been a better place to do it than right here. Visit vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution now. Get yourself a discount on your first order of a podcast or podcast series. For me for now, it's goodbye.